You ever scrolling through the website Twitter? <coughs> <coughs> uh, sorry, um, uh, X.com and happen upon an image of a busty anime woman with an oddly greasy sheen? Then you look a little closer and wait, what? Why, why does she have so many fingers? Is that her shirt or her hair? What's going on here? Sadly, this wonderful experience is becoming more and more rare as AI models get more and more accurate. Nowadays, so long as the AI artist has gone outside at least once and doesn't, like, front light something that should be backlit, typically you have to look a lot closer to be certain if something is AI or hand-drawn. So is that it then, for us human artists? Should we just put down our pencils and quit? If I can no longer discern between AI and human art, is there any point in distinguishing them? Was there ever a point in distinguishing them? The rise of AI does raise some interesting questions about the nature of art. So today I want to ask and maybe answer some of those questions. I also want to talk about the strengths and limitations of AI art, and maybe even propose a way to make genuinely good AI art that everyone, even the biggest AI haters, can be on board with. Okay, so before I get started, I should mention that I'm coming at this from an artistic and theoretic perspective. So all the other stuff that people worry about, like art theft, the proliferation of deepfakes, yada yada, I'll just be putting aside for now. These are so important, I'm just not addressing them here. So with that being said, before we can move any further, there is one very important question that we have to address. Like, what even is art? The problem with trying to say something is or isn't art is that artists have spent pretty much the last hundred years proving that anything can be art. A black square? Art. A literal urinal? Yeah, that's, that's art alright. Poop? Man, <laughs> do we really have to count that? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately we do. In 1961, the artist Piero Manzoni pooped in a can, put a label on it, and sold it for its weight in gold as the artwork Artist Shit. Even if we don't want to count this as art, functionally and factually, it is. It's stuff like this that makes me think instead of asking, is this art, a more useful question is, where is the artistry? To answer that question, let's try breaking down artist shit into its constituent parts. We have the poop, at least presumably. We have steel cans, so there's no peeking with x-rays or anything like that. We have the label, which says artist shit in four different languages, and we have the sale and presentation as art. Maybe we could break it down even further, but let's just stop here for now. Now we could ask some other questions, like suppose it was unlabeled. What if Menzoni had used a glass jar? What if he had pissed in the jar or put dirt in it? What if instead of selling it, he donated it to a museum? These are all potential different choices that would have created different artworks that we would have to understand differently. Therefore, what imbues the artwork with its artiness, what distinguishes artist shit from non-artistic poop, are these choices. If we generalize this to other maybe more conventional artworks, what makes an object art basically comes down to the choices inherent to the construction of the object as art. The artistry of a painting comes down to the choice of each brushstroke and color. In music, each note, chord, and instrument. In a marble sculpture, each swing of the hammer and each cut of the chisel. Wait, what's that? Huh? Oh, 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 no, 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 oh, fuck, it's the hater in the walls! Ah, ha, ha, ha. I found you out. Fool that you are, you believe the author is alive and well and thriving. Haven't you heard? The author is dead. Since when did authorial intent matter in art? You fool, you buffoon, you idiot, you dunce, you moron, you poopy head, you cringer, you soy boy, you d- Oh yeah, this is kind of just what we're trying to do right now. Hey. You hear that? Yeah, l listen closely. Yeah, you hear that sound? That's the sound of the Mona Lisa. If you go see the painting the Louvre, this is more or less what you'll hear. But when we talk about the Mona Lisa, we separate the sound from the painting itself. Why do we do this? Well, it's something I'm going to call authorial intent of production. 
In other words, the intentional process of creating the artwork. For Da Vinci, the Mona Lisa was the cumulative sum of his brushstrokes, sketches, and color choices. Whether it was kept in the secret hall of some rich Renaissance dude's castle, or carted off to France and placed behind a sheet of bulletproof glass 500 years later for dozens of people to admire at a time, didn't really factor into the artistic production of the piece. Authorial intent of production contrasts with authorial intent of meaning, which is what Death of the Author is actually about. We don't know what Da Vinci meant to convey with the Mona Lisa, and it doesn't actually matter that much, but we do know what the Mona Lisa is. The term authorial intent of production is kind of long and maybe even a bit misleading because it's more a framework for us to read an artwork rather than us actually caring about the artist's feelings, so let's call it by a snappier name. Medium. That's, that's what medium is. It's the space of possible productive decisions that an artist works within, or rather, a reader interprets a piece within. Maybe Da Vinci did consider the presentation of the Mona Lisa to be part of the work, but we don't, because we think of it as a painting, as being within the medium of painting. And we have to give art a medium. If we don't, you know, we disregard the intent of production entirely, then I could do an interpretive dance and say it's part of the same artwork as the Mona Lisa, and you wouldn't be able to say I'm wrong. But since medium exists, you can say I'm wrong. And I suck at dancing. I, I guess you could say that second part either way. But in, in any case, medium gives structure to our understanding of art. So to judge whether art is good or not, we have to look at how it operates within a specific medium. Given the space of possible choices the medium provides, does the artist make interesting, compelling, novel, or beautiful choices? Okay, I've talked a lot about art now, but I haven't really mentioned AI yet. So how does AI art fit into all of this? If you ask an AI to create a beautiful sunset, the image it spits out will be, well, a beautiful sunset. But because the medium we're working in is limited to inserting prompts into the AI, we can't only look at the sunset and call it art. The black box nature of how AI turns the prompts into an image makes it so that the generated picture of the sunset alone is as much art as an actual sunset is art, which is to say, not art at all. The real artistry here is the prompt, which is an expression of an idea. In a way, AI prompting kind of acts like an anti-medium, where the process of production is entirely ignored and the idea becomes paramount. This means AI art is best for things where the idea is pretty much all that matters and specific execution is incidental to the primary purpose, so things like propaganda, or corporate clip art, or messaging app stickers, or shit posts. Spongebob dunking on Goku is in and of itself an interesting idea, and it works as a shit post as long as it's readably executed. Thinking back to the early days of AI art, when its faces were tangled masses of flesh and shadow, and its environments were hazy fields of uncertain color, and the images were just barely readable. AI shitposting was already popping off. But if we buy this idea of AI art being anti-medium, it's extremely artistically limited. Even outside the realm of quote-unquote high art, using it for something like fan art essentially flattens all specificity and deliberateness. I guess it's okay if all you're looking for is a pretty picture, like in the case of the sunset, and you can get a little more specific with it. Like, watch this. Woman. Beautiful. Big breasts. Huge breasts. Photorealism. Pixar style. Many teeth. Anime. Beautiful. HG render. Digital art. Big boob. Anime. Giant gazongas. Huge honkers. Mass- Anyways, thankfully, AI art doesn't have to be anti-medium. How so? In her article, AI and the American Smile, the essayist Jenka describes how the connotations and deployments of smiles are not universal across time and space. Yet, when you prompt an AI to generate selfies of different groups of people across space and time, for example, samurai, Aztecs, soldiers in World War I, it defaults to giving them a wide, toothy, characteristically American smile. She asks the question, 
In the same way that English language emotion concepts have colonized psychology, AI, dominated by American influence image sources, is producing a new visual monoculture of facial expressions. As we increasingly seek our own likenesses in AI reflections, what does it mean for distinct cultural histories and meanings of facial expressions to become mischaracterized, homogenized, subsumed under the dominant dataset? On the flip side, Twitter user Neil Klee discovered that if you prompt Dali to generate a comic strip, but don't tell it what to put in the text boxes, it will sometimes default to putting the name of a racial or ethnic group in the text boxes, which seems to be the result of OpenAI, the company which made Dali, essentially trying to address Jenka's question and account for some of the biases in the dataset. The issue being that even with the inclusion of racial minorities, their portrayal is still dictated by the dominant dataset, this solution entirely misses the problem at all. So what do these two examples have to do with the medium of AI art? Well, they show that AI isn't a complete black box. The images it produces reflect the hegemonic American culture of the internet. They reflect the dataset. They also reflect what the parent company wants to do with this dataset. With this awareness, another way AI art works as a medium is that by choosing AI as their tool to make art, the artist, by default, interacts with and reflects these forces. The thing is, even with this whole reflection thing, AI art is still extremely limited. An artist controls their own paintbrush, and as long as that's the case, they can paint whatever they want. A corporation controls the data set. And as long as that's the case, the artist can only paint the corporation. At best, AI art holds a mirror up to the dominant society, and there's only so much you could hold a mirror up to something before it just becomes flattery. So the question remains, how can we really make good AI art? Okay everyone, I have a bit of confession to make. During this whole discussion of AI art, I've been lying to you. Well, maybe not lying, but I have been concealing some information. So when I've talked about AIR, I've been assuming that the only input the artist can have is through the prompt. But of course, that's not true. The other thing we can do is mess with the training data. And this, I think, is where AIR actually starts to get interesting. Why? Well, consider salmon. If I asked you to draw salmon in a river, I mean, you know what a salmon is, so you draw something to the effect of this. Nowadays, if you ask AI to draw salmon in a river, you probably get something pretty similar. But early on in the development of AI, I remember someone prompted this exact thing and got images of giant pink-orange strips of salmon fillet floating around in a stream. Why did this happen? Well, because the world of the AI is the training data. By scraping the internet, it's been trained to associate salmon with fish flesh rather than actual fish. Though actually, it's more accurate to say pictures of fish flesh. Remember, the AI operates in a world of images and keywords. There's nothing corporeal. Even though it can show you a picture of salmon, it has no notion of what the thing it's drawn is other than that it's called salmon. By controlling this training data, you're essentially creating the universe from which the AI produces art. This, combined with the fact that AI conceals, or rather, AI is a black box in how it produces art, means that AI art can actually only be understood in the context of the training data, and not the wider world. We've actually already kind of seen this. The default datasets that AI art programs use are produced from scraping the internet and then curated a bit by big corporations. And therefore, AI art always reflects wider internet culture or the corporations controlling it. So if the artist actually controls the dataset, they can make AI paint whatever they want. And this is actually like crazy. This is bonkers. If I draw a picture of a salmon, it always has to be understood in the context of a real salmon. If AI draws a picture of a salmon, it has to be understood in the context of the training data. Because you break that tether between reality and representation. And that's the true power of AI art. Imagine, right after the invention of the camera, the first photographers were thinking, you know, how do we legitimize our work as art? One of them goes, hey, why don't we just go in an art museum and take a picture of all the paintings? Those are art, so surely our photos will be art too. To me, this is pretty analogous to the current discourse surrounding AI art. 
where AI artists just aren't seeing the full potential of their tools. You could create an alternate universe of art, but only if you control the data set. Anyways, data manipulation is extremely labor intensive. OpenAI had to hire a bunch of underpaid, overexploited workers in Kenya and India to get ChatGPT to not be racist. But building your own dataset means you don't have to deal with your AI being accidentally racist. This still takes enormous amounts of time and energy. The thing is, more work doesn't automatically mean better art. I mean, I spent like half this video talking about artist shit, and you artists are clever people. So give it some thought. Take some time to imagine. Maybe you could come up with a simpler way to do things. Or maybe I'm just overestimating how hard it is. In any case, AI art doesn't have to suck. So yeah, uh, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Um, and let me know what you think in the comments. You know, do you agree, disagree? Do you think I raised some interesting points? Um, you know, in the time it took me to finish this video from beginning to end, so much random stuff happened with AI art. Like, there's so much stuff that I, like, wanted to cover but just couldn't because otherwise I'd never actually release this. Um, but despite everything, I, I think my analysis still mostly holds, so that's, that's a good sign. Anyways, uh, silly stuff aside, right now there is a genocide happening in Gaza at the hands of the Israeli state. Uh, I've left some links below to places where you can donate to either individual families trying to escape the situation or to aid organizations delivering things like food and medicine to the, pe the Palestinian people who need it right now. Uh, even if you can't donate, Please just try to spread the word, you know, let people know, attend protests if you can. All these things will help. Um, yeah, thank you.